welcome to the fourth and final Capital Program Facilitation Committee meeting 2017. Today we are going to just talk briefly about CDBG and our timeliness. I'm going to give a quick update on that and then we're going to spend the rest of the time giving some highlights from all of our department accomplishments with the 2017 Capital Program. Last week we took a look at the funds that are in our line of credit with HUD and we did a probable conservative estimate of the funds we thought would go out the door before our deadline on January 31st, 2018. At the time we had $3.8 million that we were over our timeliness limit. So we contacted the different departments, got updates um, along with Mike Petrucci and the CDBG team on the probable and expected expenditures from different departments. Um, as you can see, we end up at the very bottom with just $319,000 um, underneath the threshold, that's not a lot of bandwidth. So we really need to execute on all the projects that are listed here. Um, thanks again to all the departments for really digging through each individual project, each contract, going through with the project managers and the vendors to determine exactly what you think you'll be able to safely invoice by that date. Um, I know it's a lot of work, but it's really helping us do some critical planning, helping us move some legislation and get the money spent before the, the timeliness deadline. Did an update of these numbers last night. Um, we are actually down to a little over three million right now. So we're, we've spent almost $800,000 in a little bit over a week. We hope to continue that pace. So if you have any delays with the controller's office, any concerns about contractors or vendors not getting invoices back to the city in time, please feel free to escalate us. We are a resource as a whole team, Mike's team as well, that can help you in any way that, that you guys need help. Um, the other really important thing is for 2018, we don't have a totally finalized CDBG budget. We have um, the mayor's budget and some amendments that have been made by council so far. Um, once we do have the finalized legislated 2018 CDBG budget, we'll be sure to send that around to all of the departments and project managers. Please be sure to look at those projects again. If there's anything that might concern you, if you have new staff who are unfamiliar with the process, if you have projects that may have complications with environmental reviews or historic preservation, please feel free to reach out to myself or Mike Petrucci. His team is a great resource to help guide you through that process. We want to make sure that we're proactive about getting things done. Um, also, if there's any projects you don't feel you can complete in 2018, please let us know. We will reprogram the money and we'll do our best to reprogram it back whenever you do feel that you can complete the program. If there's anything you think also is going to come under budget, um, as soon as you know, it's hard to know when you're in the middle of the project until the very end and all the invoices come in exactly how much something costs. But if you have a hunch that there's, there's going to be a chunk of money at the end of your CDBG project, please let us know and we can help reprogram that as well through legislation. We want to make sure that the city benefits uh, from the largest CDBG program that we can possibly have. And with that, I'm going to ask each uh, department director to do a presentation of their highlights. Feel free to introduce yourselves at that time. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ray Gastel, director of the City Planning Department. Thank you for the opportunity to go over the capital budget that we uh, we're going to look at spending that we have. Uh, been doing in uh, earlier than this year and what we're sort of finished up in 2017 as well as stuff that's ongoing into the next year uh, based on that and then we'll also present the 2018 uh, what we plan to do in 2018 so uh, in the completed projects category we're very proud to have completed the Greenways 2.0 uh, project, which includes not only the assessment of looking at where we are with all the greenways that already exist, but also have a, a tool, a kit, and a sort of an a manual that helps people actually understand how they, as members of the city, as, as citizens of the city, can actually actively participate in developing greenways, maintaining them, and stewarding them. This is something which is a, a foundational kind of uh, city and community partnership in how we approach this. But we've done the work so that we actually know what we've got know the direction of where we're going, and also have the tools for people to engage in it directly. Next we have uh, another, there's the Uptown Eco Innovation District Plan, 
and the zoning that goes with that. As you may know, City Council just quite recently passed the Uptown Public Realm Zoning, which is the first zoning in the history of Pittsburgh that includes an incentive for affordable housing, as well as for stormwater management and other goals. It uses that through a height and density, effectively a height bonus, rather, uh, which allows a, helps incentivize that contribution to the goals that the community set through a eco-innovation community planning process. This is also done in connection with the plan that the city City and county and uh, have worked together on to have a BRT, a bus rapid transit system here. We made the commitment to the community that we would not just sort of put in place a new piece of infrastructure such as a, a, the BRT as a connector between Oakland and downtown, but rather we would focus on the community itself and make sure that it was not just a place to pass through, but a place that really had a destiny as a really important part of Pittsburgh, an opportunity for living, working, and recreation and learning. The, just to give you a sense, the planning uh, commission passed the community plan in, uh, earlier in the fall, and then just recently, within about two weeks ago, the city council passed the, the zoning that goes with it. Uh, so that it won't, the injury won't happen again. Uh, and the uh, next item is uh, here is, a, this one is a, is a, a modern sculpture, uh, the James Myford sculpture in Emerald View Park, which was also repaired. Uh, this, you know, all of our, the reality is all of these works of public art sit out in the rain and the cold and, you know, we do have a weather system and so we're actually, uh, we'll tell you a little bit more in a moment, but we're really getting much better at having a, we already had a list basically of all of them, their conditions, but we've updated that. We're working together with OMB and the city as a whole on the cartograph system so that we really have a record of this so we can make more, better, quicker decisions of how to address these, uh, this public, uh, how to, which, which are the priorities and which are the, where, and looking throughout the whole city and we're going to be doing that more effectively. We can't do this without our partnership with DPW, which are, you know, we sort of end up being part of helping identify it, but in the end, the actual contracts and the, while well, we may sort of technically manage aspects of the contract, at the same time, we're working with DPW to get the work done. Uh, and it's a great partnership, which has really allowed us to get, we think it's a partnership which has allowed us to get a number of projects done in the past, and we really think we're set up now to really get, get even more done, as maybe Director Gable will uh, articulate. Uh, this is another one, the uh, Bordis sculpture that's at the Shenley Park swimming pool, getting under the actual repair uh, activity, because there is, you know, these are, these are capital projects. We're repairing uh, pieces of sculpture out in the, out in the rain. Uh, this is a uh, planning which is for, you know, ultimately will be what we hope is transformational uh, impacts for communities, uh, which is, we're sort of, we have three neighborhood plans that we mentioned, the one that was in Uptown and uh, the, that one that has just sort of been completed, but here are ones that we begin with uh, uh, budgeting in 2017 and these will be completed in 2018. They include Hazelwood, Homewood, and Manchester Chateau. All of these have had their kickoff meetings. All of these are actually on to the next phases. We're getting great input from communities. This particular illustration of uh, the work, I believe, in Homewood. And uh, I was fortunate to be able to be uh, at every one of the kickoff meetings. And I can say there was engagement, interest, commitment. We have strong consultants, strong community participation, strong staff really working together. And as a real leadership opportunities for the community, we're building leadership capacity in the community through this process. It's sort of we, we really are truly partnering with communities and let, they take the leadership role in many aspects of these projects. So we thank them for that hard work because we think it's going to be a terrific result. This is another ongoing project for 2017, the Southside Park Master Plan. The, the work's already begun. Really excited. This is a park that is a, you know, is a popular park, but at the same time has a lot of improvements to be made, uh, you know, both in sort of its ecological management as well as its programming. And this is an opportunity through this master planning work to get that done. This is uh, looking at riverfront zoning. I just want to point out this is a uh, work that uh, is all 35 miles of the riverfronts. And as you can see, it's quite a quite a territory. Uh, we have reached a, a really exciting stage after we've had workshops, uh, you know, sort of point of view, kind of basic kind of like coming to sort of visioning, but now we're already written essentially draft legislation 
for where it should be. And we're just in the midst. We finished a full day workshop yesterday and a last evening in the Tuesday evening, and now we're going to do another one this evening. We've gotten great participation, and <coughs> people understand exactly what it is. They know why we've gotten to this kind of precise point. We're also doing focus groups as well as a sort of larger uh, community sessions. And you know, we expect you know we don't expect everyone to agree on everything. I think that now as we get we finally put real numbers on things like what are the heights we think are right. What are the you know and this is really comes from the work we've done with others. What are the heights? What's the zoning? You know, what are the, and, the, and now that it's really getting to the specifics, it's going to be there's going to be a lot of vigorous discussions. But we have plans to get this uh, into code. Uh, you know, before uh, in, up to city council. Uh, you know, in the second quarter, uh, early second quarter of next year. Uh, ongoing project ADA. This is work that we do. That this is the there's many aspects of this, but I think one of the most successful aspects is this hearing loops that have been installed. Uh, we now, I think, have them in every healthy, active living center. Uh, in the uh, well, with this work, with the 2018 budget, we will finish getting them into every healthy, active living center. I have heard from individuals that have used them and experienced them in the ones where we already have them installed that they are terrific. As most of you know, they're like a, a sort of a, a system that allows, basically, if you have a assisted hearing, you're able to connect up to this sort of system that makes sure it really comes in crystal clear to you. And it's, it's really improved their experience of using these facilities. Uh, this is a, in the uh, zone of uh, war monuments and public art. This is just we've, what we've been able to do is we're now have much better information online about just the same way that we're doing it in a kind of technical way of if through cartograph and making sure we have the information about the condition. This is giving you the, the public, the outfacing part to sort of say this is, this is what they are, this is their history, this is the you know, sort of an image of it. We've never quite had this before and now we finally have it in a really coherent and very uh, useful uh, interactive map way that we're proud of and we're going to expand. And at this point, we're still mostly on the, the monuments. We're just beginning. We haven't gotten all the way to all the public art yet, but we're, we're, we're going to get there uh, and, and very soon. And this is the architectural inventory. This is our cultural heritage plan. It's follow through on a part of our comprehensive plan. We have moved through about uh, five neighborhoods already, which are th three or completed, or then I think there's actually two more that are sort of almost, uh, two or three more that are almost done. And then for 2017, we have the resources to really keep going. And they, we started in Troy Hill. We worked, we worked through Spring Garden, Sp uh, Spring Hill, Carrick, Larimer, Brookline. I think this is, this is, um, come on folks, this Brookline? Yeah, Brookline. this is Brookline. Uh, and, uh, which, and you can see the way, this, we wanted you to see the way this works. Um, that you, when you do this kind of survey, this isn't like making it a historic district per se, but you're sort of, you take the areas that you know may have some historic significance, and then what you're looking for is the integrity level. Now, integrity is sort of a big word. All this means here is the, that the architecture is, in, is, is, still has the integrity of when it was first constructed. So if it was a wood house with wood windows and a, and a, a slate roof, if you, you'd have 100% integrity if it still had wood windows, you know, wood uh, cladding and a, and a slate roof. But with what this is telling you is that this history, the red, which you can't really quite see, but the, the red means it's really very high integrity. But the question is with this type of, uh, with, but it's still not, you can see it's less than about 30% of the folks in, of, the, of the projects in this area. Now, if you were had a higher level of integrity, you might be saying you want to have a historic district with all the regulations of a historic district. But when you have a, a low, when it's still a significant, uh, significant cultural and historical aspect to it, but at the same time, you may not have that level of integrity. Too many of the buildings have been changed to be a sort of regular historic district, et cetera. What you might choose is to do something. We don't know exactly what this will work. First, this is just the resource and learning about it, which is really important to the State Historic Preservation Office. They want us to have this for every part of the city. We're actually marching through and really beginning to have it. And that's just important for any type of project. This also could be important for moving forward with a concept that we are, more than a concept, but the, the, in 2018, we'll be developing conservation district guidelines. Not historic district guidelines, but conservation districts to allow you to retain the character of the district and sort of, and this will be a great help in looking at that and helping establish uh, where is the right opportunity for that. Next, we have uh, park planning, and this is Sheridan Park, a park which uh, really looking forward to working on this. This park is uh, is going to we really see a future for it, and the community sees a future for it, which will be much more used than it is today. And uh, we're uh, that is will be underway in 2018. 
And then here's the park planning. Now this is really uh, with the uh, Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy is going to be working on this in, in, in depth as well. But this is the Emerald because this is one of the five key parks in the city that are a core area for their work. And, uh, but this Emerald View Park, and this is sort of like a, as you can tell, it's a really very special park that has been sort of formed out of other parks uh, rather recently, so it can become a coherent system. And it's also one of the most, uh, has some of the most spectacular views of Pittsburgh uh, in the city. So we're looking forward to that uh, happening as well. So that's the summary of our projects, and I'm um, happy to turn it over to the next vote. Good afternoon, Mike, uh, Mike Abel with the, the Director for the Department of Public Works. And uh, the Department of Public Works in 2017 was charged with uh, managing over 170 deliverables. I'm certainly not going to stand up here and show you 170 different slides, but we do have 14 projects or deliverables that we'd like to present to you. So the first project is Allegheny Commons Park, Sue Murray Pool. Uh, we continue to make capital investments in our 18 outdoor pools. In 2017, two more pools had new liners installed. But before the liners installed, we have to make sure the structure is able to accept the new liner. Uh, we're doing liners because we get longevity and don't have to repaint the pools every two to three years. So uh, in this picture here is just showing the uh, pool, some concrete work done beforehand, and then the after is right there. So it's uh, a new liner that we won't have to go in and paint every couple or three years. You'll get longevity out of it and uh, improve the visual appearance. The cost of the project was about $100,665. The next project is the Arlington Park Spray Pool. So in the previous project, I mentioned that we had 18 out outdoor pools, but at one time we had 31 outdoor pools. And Arlington, Arlington Pool was one of them. This pool was decommissioned and sat vacant for many, many years. And this basically was an eyesore to the, to the neighborhood. So several years ago, uh, collectively with the Department of Public, or Public Works, Parks and Rec, and the uh, Office of Budget and Management, started to convert the closed pools to spray parks. And this park is the sixth pool that has since been converted. So the pool basin was filled into grade. The caretaker's residence or building, which is actually where I'm, where we're viewing it from behind me would have been a building that would house a resident caretaker at one time, was demolished and then the bathhouse was renovated. And so the, so this is the uh, bathhouse right here, obviously the old pool. And so the renovation now looks like that of an improved, a very improved park space. Uh, the building has be, been demolished and the bathhouse has been renovated to accommodate the, the spray park. The cost for the project was $1,071,816. The next project was uh, Banksville Park, uh, the concession stand. So in order to complement the deck hockey rink, which uh, in the picture here is right up here, which was uh, uh, funded by the Pittsburgh Penguins Foundation, uh, in conjunction with pu Public Works and helping to install that rink, it became necessary to install a prefabricated structure that would support the rink and its operations by providing storage, concessions, and restrooms. There is an existing structure in the park, but it really serves for the pool and a rentable shelter. So the, and then to, in order to access it, you'd have to walk across a parking lot to get to it. So that, you know, with a lot of youth up there, that really wasn't the best uh, choice. So we uh, went with a prefab building, um, and we have been moving to these prefab units because it's actually getting a, a, a building installed very quickly. And a lot of uh, savings was incurred on this project by uh, Public Works in-house personnel doing a lot of the work, the excavation, the plumbing, things of that nature. So in order to accommodate, we've used that space, and now we have a prefab building that can serve the public and serve that uh, deck hockey rink. And the uh, cost for that renovation was $219,720. The next project was the Beachview Senior Citizens, which I think now will be a, uh, actually a Beachview Community Center. Uh, I believe it was an old building that uh, housed the senior citizens, but the, that we leased it, I believe. 
and now the city has uh, had purchased the building. Uh, it allowed us to make major improvements to both the exterior and the interior of the structure. Uh, so from the outside, you can see um, it does have a better appearance. Um, really, though, most of the work is on the inside, but uh, more improved entrances, improved storefronts, improved look here, plus all the windows have been upgraded and then some painting. So it's got a nice new refreshed look in, uh, in Beachview. And then interior-wise, uh, you know, hallways and some of the rooms that are up there. So this renovation was in the neighborhood of $3,800,000. Um, the next project is actually, it will be two of these. Uh, uh, traffic signal improvements. This one is in particular in Shenley Park at the Bartlett and uh, Panther Hollow Road. And basically the improvements here are you know, new traffic signals, new lighting, crosswalks, and ADA um, ramps with truncated domes. So a uh, very good improvement in that uh, major intersection. And the same thing for Hamilton Avenue and North Braddock, the same thing. New lighting, traffic signals, crosswalks, ADA ramps. So improvements in those two. And there were a lot of others, but these were just two of that. Total for those two packages together were $535,000. The next project was, I don't have a before for you, but uh, what we did is we, uh, Marmaduke uh, Park, uh, the deck hockey, uh, was installed several years ago, and the level of play at this facility has been just uh, simply overwhelming. Uh, that the actual court surface had to be replaced last year, I think it was about $80,000. In order to complement this uh, location and the over amount, overwhelming amount of play, uh, the desire was to put in a grandstand uh, to accommodate the crowds to come and watch the play. And it uh, is an ADA ramp here, so it serves uh, a multitude of populations. Uh, this uh, project costs $46,720. The next project was, uh, we've done this for a number of our playgrounds. Uh, as you know, back in the mid-90s to the early 2000s, uh, uh, a lot of our playgrounds, we actually have 120 playgrounds, have been renovated. Um, some of them now are beginning to show their age and some fatigue, but we don't have to go in and uh, tear the whole playground out and build a new playground. What we're able to do is we're able to go in and maybe replace the you know, faded plastic parts. We electrostatically paint the metal parts, and we've also replaced the safety surface. So in this particular case, we, many years ago, we did go with a poured in place, and have just found that the, it's just not, we're not getting the longevity out of the um, poured in place. It looks nice, it, it was easy, it's like fixing, you know, a sidewalk, pouring new concrete, but it, uh, we had a lot of other problems with it. So we've gone to, uh, to the tiles, and so this is sort of the same playground, a little fresher look, and now we get to look, we'll still get the longevity out of the playground. We've increased the life uh, with the safety surface and put a fresh look on our playground. So we've done that on a number of playgrounds around the city. This particular renovation uh, costs $77,951. The next project was uh, Phillips Park at the entry. Um, as you can see, it's sort of a, not a very exciting uh, entrance a uh, little blasé and uh, a little bit confusing in terms of pedestrian versus vehicular entrance. So um, this was actually uh, some funding that uh, Councilwoman Rudiak had garnered and our staff uh, helped to design it and uh, improve the appearance of the entrance. So we've got you know some seating here so people can sit outside and be you know social. Um, we've got some parking st spots here for ADA compliance. Um, it's just a, a very uh, improved space uh, for Phillips Park. The uh, total cost for that project was $100,000, $665. Uh, the next project uh, was the Shenley Park Pool Building and ADA improvements. So this is, again, in one of our rad parks and is a very popular pool. Uh, but there were problems with the building inside. Water on the backside uh, of the building was getting in there. Uh, and the building just didn't serve um, the ADA population plus everything that was crammed in there. So the staff did do some exterior work. We did some new lighting, um, some improvements on the outside, but more so it was the renovations to um, the building and the addition of this portion. So we added on to the building for the filter building. And uh, as previously mentioned by Director Gastel, here is the art piece that was uh, put on to uh, uh, the Shenley Park project. And you can see the exterior lighting and uh, just visually looks in, uh, uh, much better there. This project uh, in conjunction with use of uh, RAD uh, dollars was 1499000 Uh 
The next project uh, was the Southside Market House. And this particular, this is uh, obviously one of our historic structures. And over the years has received a, a lot of other capital investments for the windows and the interior of the building. Uh, in this particular case, it became necessary to replace the roof. Um, so the improvement is a, a brand new roof on the Southside Market House. Uh, I would hope that everything's complete for this particular uh, bill, <laughs> we'll see. But um, a roof job at 709,000, but it is a rather large roof. Uh, the next one was uh, another project that was mentioned previously by uh, Director Gastil. Uh, and this was where that monument that he referenced earlier, the Troy Hill Monument, uh, actually sat here. And it's not here because it always kept getting hit by a car. And I think, what, it's like the third time it got hit by a car. So um, the staff worked on this intersection and um, tried to give a better home for the monument, which you can't see in this picture, but you have to trust me, it's behind the evergreen right now. But the, the island is a little bit raised, uh, giving the uh, monument a little better chance. Maybe we should just leave the tree there and <laughs> give, the, give the monument even a better chance of surviving. But uh, you can see that the um, streets have been resurfaced, crosswalks, ramps uh, with truncated domes, an improved island and landscaped island. And, uh, you know, the, the community has a lot of ceremonies in this particular place, especially the veterans. This particular project cost uh, $80,000. Uh, the next one, uh, we're going to see the results of this in 2018. So if you go around the city, you're going to see uh, four, five, six different styles of litter receptacles around the city. The old, old community green cans that have been painted all green, um, knockoffs that are supposed to look like the standard that we've established. Um, this is actually a knockoff, and so the hinges didn't work, the gate, you know, the, the door fell off, the cans look like this. So what we're doing is we're moving to a standard uh, uh, litter receptacle that actually has a sensor on it. So if you don't know that our crews go around uh, every day and they look at every one of these litter receptacles. And the reality is most of the litter receptacles do not need to be emptied. So we found out in some days they may only have to empty 10 cans, uh, some days 20. And what that, um, what that allows us to do is that they only empty the cans that need to be emptied and that takes those resources and are able to put them to other tasks that can be done in public works. So we've just started to roll this out. Uh, we've had funding over two years. Uh, we have uh, now have these, I think, now in three of the divisions. And we're activating the sensors so that the divisions know exactly when. They don't have to wait till they're full. I want people to understand that we don't wait, wait till they get to 100% full. We'll pick a standard that maybe the can's 70% full. The supervisors will be given a list and tell them what cans need to be emptied and a route for them. And everything about it is all very efficient. And that crew can empty those 20 cans and they can come back in and they can get other things done. So we'll see the results of this more in 2018. And I hope in next year, if I come back with this, to be able to report more on this. And the last project is the Greenfield Bridge. And in all honesty, out of due respect for my former assistant director, Pat Hassett, um, I know that I cannot do this project justice. But I'm going to go do a little spin on it because I would hope that uh, the, the department following uh, mobility and infrastructure is going to maybe have a little piece on it. Maybe I don't know. Okay, well, then you can speak at will about it, Pat, because it was Pat's baby for 10 years. Two years of actual construction, and if any, and nobody knows it, it takes about 10 years to design a bridge, all the planning. It's a long process. But for us, it's probably the largest public works project the city has ever seen. The project started with a spectacular implosion of the old bridge. And if you don't know it, there's three things that everybody in Pittsburgh likes. Bobbleheads, fireworks, and implosions. Right? Okay. Um, subsequently, you know, we affected uh, Interstate 376 with minimal disruption to the public. And um, you know, it sort of ended with a bridge of similar style in keeping with some of the amenities like the monuments at either end of the bridge. So while restoring the connection with Greenfield and Squirrel Hill. So that's sort of the old look of the bridge. And ta-da. So you can see there's a lot of similarities in terms of the arch. A lot of the verticals are gone. But we've kept the monuments, improved lighting, different style of uh, barrier, 
Um, so this, I hope uh, Pat or uh, uh, Director Ricks will uh, speak a little bit more to this, but uh, this project was $19 million. And with that, I uh, conclude our presentation. Thank you. So everything I'm going to talk about from the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure is really to be credited this year to the Department of Public Works. Um, most of these projects, or the, the uh, Department of City Planning, most of these projects came out of their um, budgets. And as we sort of began the establishment of this department midway through the year, um, we were able to achieve some of them later. Um, so just sort of going through those that are in the capital budget that, that uh, we were able to complete or substantially advance this year. Um, the Grandview Avenue elevated sidewalks. Grandview Avenue, of course, is one of the um, signature places in the city of Pittsburgh. We have many, many visitors that come there every year. Um, really a great opportunity to look out and see the great skyline of the city. Um, but it is at the top of a very steep uh, hill. Some of the sidewalks are, in fact, uh, elevated um, and held above the hillside and we're in need of repair. And so we began the first uh, segment of work uh, here in rebuilding those uh, elevated sidewalks at the cost of about a quarter million dollars. Um, but they look lovely. They uh, were completed um, uh, relatively quickly. New fencing, new sidewalk, new um, structure beneath it holding those up. There's still more work to do as in the coming year we'll continue on the next segment of sidewalk there. Henderson Street Wall. Um, was another important uh, project that we undertook. This wall is actually just under a quarter of a mile long, so it's a substantial uh, piece of infrastructure that needed um, repair and upgrade and replacement. Um, so we undertook this. It took uh, nearly a year from September of last year to just uh, last month um, when the project was completed again, roughly a quarter million dollar um, project, but really um, puts this structure then in place for the next um, several decades um, for the city. Uh, Reed Street Wall is in the Hill District, another um, significant um, piece of infrastructure that we needed to um, look at. This was a relatively short section of wall, but in an important neighborhood and on an important street. Um, so looking at this, uh, just 40 feet long, but it ranged in height from just a two-foot wall uh, up to an eight-foot uh, maximum height. Uh, we redid the sidewalks, redid the wall, redid the curbs um, to really uh, new custom fencing in the area. So quite a transformative project for this community. Um, again, it was, it was begun uh, earlier this year. It was uh, done in just two months' time from October to December um, in the last quarter uh, of this year. Mun Wharf is a, another major project Director Gable was speaking about. Um, the Greenfield Bridge, this is just as, as significant a piece of infrastructure. It's actually a project that was brought to us from River Life. Um, Department of City Planning played a role. Many other departments played a role in this project. This is a link that's been missing for more than 20 years in the city segment, uh, in the city uh, system, uh, allowing bicycles, pedestrians, persons with disabilities to make the connection from um, Smithfield down to the Mon Wharf and continue on that trail system to Point State Park. Um, the project is uh, ongoing, um, so we're well underway now. Um, had hoped to have it mar substantially completed in this year, but we will spill out over um, into next year. It's a $3.4 million project. Uh, healthy Ride, so the city's bike share system is part of, uh, is being supported in part by the city. Um, and we really are, have done a lot to advance that program and um, continue its usefulness and its, and its uh, utilization in the city. One of the big moves um, that happened this year was integrating um, the Healthy Ride uh, system with the Port Authority system. So now anyone who has a Connect card um, and is in the transit uh, system is, is a user on the, the, the bus or light rail system can use that uh, same card, that same account that they've, they have to establish that card 
um, to receive 15 minutes of free um, bike share use. So there's no limit to the number of times that you can use those 15 minutes, provided you don't exceed um, the 15 minute um, time frame. So uh, that's been a been a been a great improvement. We've also changed out the docks um, of the system, so they used to be a little bit difficult to get the bikes in and out of, um, and now um, Healthy Ride rather has changed out. Um, to a new dock style, which makes it easier to lock and unlock the bikes. Um, we've had just under a quarter of a million users on the system since the system launched in 2015. Um, and have about 60,000 registered users, but again, um, the, those using the Port Authority system um, don't necessarily have to register and become members in the system. So we've seen a lot of use just from that um, launch that was about four months ago now. Um, City Accelerator STIPS project, this was a project that came over from the Department of City Planning um, and uh, OMB played a role in it. This was a national program that we were awarded as part of the Accelerator um, program to look at these very special assets of the public STEPS that we have. Um, the, the study had a very robust public engagement process. We received over uh, 1,400 surveys. Um, about the different public steps, and they will use this information to help prioritize investment, um, understanding sort of what, what critical role do the different sets of steps play in our public mobility system. So particularly those stars that connect to transit or to um, schools or to communities that, that really rely on alternative forms of mobility. Um, and so coming out of this, we'll then have a strategic plan for uh, maintenance, rehabilitation, replacement, and enhancement of the public steps, which are a very unique asset that we have in Pittsburgh. Um, the Central Business District Signal Upgrade Project continues. This is that uh, we are in phase three of a four-phase project. Um, phases one and two um, replaced 15 signals in the downtown. Phase three is adding 10 more um, to that number. Phase four will add eight more. Uh, it's a $5.5 million project, so really upgrading that um, critical uh, signal infrastructure that we have in the downtown um, so that we have a modern system and really positioning ourselves um, for the next era. Uh, construction will be complete, we hope, next year on this project. Um, and then in addition to those downtown signals, we also uh, were able to uh, upgrade or install new signals at three locations in the neighborhoods. So Ella Cape on Center, Brownsville and Parkville and Walnut and Aiken are our new signal projects. And each one of these signals um, represents a, a pretty substantial investment. So these are not low cost um, items. Um, in addition, we, we were able to implement a Safe Routes to School um, project and this is one that uh, while it incurred uh, was designed locally was a hundred percent federal and state funding um, for implementation and then there's three pretty substantial bicycle infrastructure projects that we were able to put in this year again these are projects that originated from um, the Department of City Planning and then were implemented um, this year so Bigelow Boulevard and Forbes Avenue this represented a couple of firsts for the city. It was our first contraflow uh, bike lane, so a bike lane that uh, flows in the opposite direction of traffic. Um, and it's the first time that we've installed a bike signal, so a special traffic signal that speaks just to um, bicycle movements. Um, so this is, a, this is a pilot project. This is an interim project. Uh, PennDOT will come behind us next year to do the permanent improvements on Forbes Avenue. Um, we hope by then we'll actually have the legislative authority to have parking protected bike lanes um, on this street and so we can have another uh, first in the city, well, uh, another legal first in the city of having par parking protected bike lanes. Um, and it's been pretty well received. We've seen some uh, many, many cyclists using this facility, but importantly, we've also gotten those cyclists off of the sidewalks where it's a heavily pedestrianized area. Um, and so we've seen fewer bicycles on sidewalks, um, which has helped with the accessibility and flow in this area. Allegheny Circle Cycle Track is again an interim pilot project that we're um, doing uh, in the north side. So um, you can see the Open Streets uh, project that was held in the summer to demonstrate what this facility might look like. Um, this was done in advance of a larger scale improvement to really urbanize or re-urbanize 
that area, um, improve pedestrian access, rationalize traffic flow a little bit better, improve safety, um, and really make it more of a walkable community place. It was designed um, by our own in-house engineers, so fully designed by our staff. Um, and uh, as an interim investment, it was $60,000, so uh, a low-cost investment before we go forward with a $900,000 improvement um, later on this year. As a result of this project, we were actually able to increase parking and increase parking revenues through the creation of additional paid parking spaces. Um, to the city, we have seen um, great reception of the bicycle um, facilities. Andrew uses them all the time. Um, and they work, and they're great. They've been a real benefit to the community here. And then finally, Negley Avenue, which was uh, a transportation um, uh, assistance, I'm sorry, a transportation alternative program grant um, that we received to do a uh, significant bicycle facility uh, that would serve those East End communities. And so on Negley Avenue, it created um, uh, bike lanes as well as shared uh, bicycle facilities, um, implemented bike boxes, which are the green boxes that put the uh, bicyclists in front of traffic and makes them more visible and safer at intersections. And this is also a, a heavy transit corridor. One of the things that we did with this project was really collect a lot of data. Um, so we were collecting weekly data uh, after the project went in. Now we're down to sort of monthly and then we'll probably back off to about quarterly data collection to see how it's going for uh, traffic congestion, bicycle utilization, um, and effects on, on transit and bus flow. And one of the surprising things with this project is that uh, bus, uh, I'm sorry, transit operations have actually improved and we've seen a 7% reduction um, in transit travel times on the corridor as a result of this project. So although it was designed with bicyclists in mind, it's actually had some benefits to the buses as well. Um, that's what we've got. Thank you very much. Does anybody in the room have questions or comments about the information that was just shared? If anybody watching the broadcast has any questions, you can email CIP at PittsburghPA.gov. Uh, repeating, that's CIP, PittsburghPA.gov. Um, I want to thank all of the directors, not just for presenting the, the information today, but for completing all of these projects. The, the process to build the budget, which requires a lot of collaboration with the council budget office and the council offices takes six months and sometimes it feels very complicated and onerous. Having these kind of meetings really makes me understand the challenges that all of you face. Um, they, these departments are getting difficult projects done with limited resources, challenges with weather, topography, with 300,000 different clients and 90 different neighborhoods to answer to. So please, my sincere thanks for getting this, this work done. It's really important work and it's work that the private sector wouldn't and couldn't do. So thanks again. Um, with that, we're going to close out the 2017 CPFC program. I'll see everybody in 2018.